Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is episode number two of the Brian Licata Show, and I'm uh, extremely pleased to have Mr. Dr. Demiso Josie uh, <laughs> in the house tonight, or not in my house, but in, in his house. So he's here. Uh, Dr. Josie is a former teacher of mine, uh, definitely a, a mentor in the video production world from a long time ago. Uh, he's an author, an educator, and um, as soon as I asked him to do it, he was like, yeah, I'm free tonight. <laughs> and that's just the kind of the kind of guy uh mr josie is or dr josie it's it, it's gonna get hard for me to get used to used to calling it's you that. All good, man. whatever you want to call me is fine so what the 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 one thing i really did want to talk to you about today though is um is what what's the transition been like in the uh school district for you i've seen uh, a bunch of facebook posts and other things like that from you and i'm like oh man you know, yeah i mean to be honest with you what we were tasked with um as administrators in public school is um, we had basically four weeks to reinvent how we did school um, for that. For me, that meant basically creating three different schedules because we um, had the hybrid model, which kids will come in two days a week and then be virtual. We had an option for all remote. And then we have some kids in our uh, child study um, special education area that comes in four days. So for me, it was this crazy matrix of <laughs> trying to get, students and staff all together and you know making some changes and then when i figured it out something else changed uh the last minute so it was it was, it was like a sudoku puzzle but all the boxes just kept moving all over the place um so what you saw on facebook uh, and then my post was really just uh me reflecting on a day and how crazy my day is um so shout out to all the educators out there man and, and that, that are out there doing it because it's, it's definitely uh, different uh, for sure um, but as far as my school in particular, uh, we were one of the ones that went hybrid from the beginning that didn't start mm -hmm. out remote. Um, yep. I actually think we're in a better boat because we did that because it's easier for us to go back. If we need to and then back and forth. Um, so in that sense, it was it was interesting. Um, I'm always one that looks for the positive and things. So from teachers, I kept telling them, like, you know, you just expanded your toolbox and look at all the stuff that you can do. You know, whether it's remote Google Meets and all these different platforms and things. I said, if we were back to normal, um, you just added more tools to your, your toolbox now. Um, so, you know, there's different ways that you can reach kids. And just to see, you know, these educators grow. Um, we're talking about educators that have been in the game for 30, 40 years, some of them that are right. still learning and growing. So in that sense, it was it was awesome. Um, I think my staff is wonderful. So they, you know, they, they just roll with the punches. Um, and they, we kind of just work together. Um, leadership is in, in my building is pretty decent and it's good. And everyone just pretty much is buying in and, and it's there. It's truly there for the kids. So that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, you know, it, of course, everyone's anxiety was at a thousand. Um, so trying to ease that anxiety. I mean, I had my own, but as a leader in the building, like you can't let that be shown. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of times um, early before this even happened, like when we went out in the spring mm -hmm. and then you throw on the stuff that happened socially and the stuff like that. And we could talk about that too. Um, I, I actually broke down during the meeting and like my anxiety and emotions of everything just coming in the head was like, I had to turn my zoom off for a minute and I actually cried and was like, yo, this is, and I, I'm not a, a crier, but it was just a lot. Um, but just to be able to navigate those waters and then, Again, just having a staff that's going to buy in and, and kind of ride with you would just made things easier. I think we're in a pretty decent position right now. Um, who knows tomorrow what what tomorrow will bring? But um, I think for us, for the most part, we're we're doing pretty good. Yeah, I remember. You know, my brother is in a you know similar position as you, and I remember talking to him. It, it had to be two or three weeks before the school was supposed to start. I'm like, what do you? What's your plan? And he's like. <laughs> And, and my my cousin's a, a high school teacher in the city of Philadelphia, and I was asking him the same questions, and he's like, "Yeah, I just we don't know yet." And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I, I know a lot of industries have been you know disrupted by the the coronavirus, but you know, I, I can't really think of one that had more of a greater impact, you know, on like a, just a number of different reasons, like uh, you know, other than educating the children, like it was the main source of childcare for for you know a large population of America. And trying to be able to like you know pull all that in in a short period of time is, is is pretty remarkable. But you know I think it's cool what you were saying like uh, look at some sort of you know positive 
uh they like you gained out of it like you got another like tool in the toolkit sort of thing right and one of the things and as you know i do the empowerment perspective group and i have a podcast on my own and stuff and one of the things that i was preaching while we were in the pan- pandemic in the beginning was there's opportunity that's going to happen on the back end of this thing like now's the time for you to prepare for what's going to happen on the back end um, whether you're a business owner and things of that nature are you really looking at can your employees you know work virtually now like mm-hmm. getting prepared for those spaces and you're caught and cutting costs because now you don't have to rent this big building all those things um and it, it, for the you know anyone else it's an opportunity for you to go learn a trade or learn something new that you haven't learned before like that was a perfect opportunity it still is a perfect opportunity for you to prepare what's going on in the back end so yes it's messed up Yes, it's 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 devastating, and there's a lot of things that go along with that. But there's opportunity, chaos. When you have chaos, that's when you have the most opportunity for for success in different areas. When everything is smooth and status quo, it's hard to find those 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 lanes. So I kind of always look at these situations like, well, there's an opportunity for for me to grow, or for somebody else to grow, and reinvent themselves, or whatever the case may be. Um, so that's that's important. Yeah, I you know I. We've, we've talked, you know, quite a number of times over the past like year or two, but, you know, I had my video production business was, was really doing well uh, before this all happened. You know, I had contracts in the casinos, I had uh, other small businesses, comedy clubs, uh, and I was getting like a lot of work and it kind of surprised me how, how fast that like it, you know, it, it took off. Like it seemed like every week, every Friday, every Saturday, like I had a video shoot to do. Mm-hmm. And... As soon as soon as the casinos, the, so the casinos shut down before a lot of like we went on the statewide lockdown, and as soon as that happened with the casinos, I was like, all right, if they shut the casinos down, like the Atlantic City casinos, they shut those down, like that's that's a problem. Um, right. So I, I knew it was going to be bad. It was funny. I have a, a friend uh, who works at one of the casinos, and he's uh, like, I guess in the carpenters union, and. Uh, he said at, uh, I think it was either Resorts or Bally's is where he's at, and they had to put locks on the doors going to the boardwalk because they don't even have them because they've never been closed before. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, when he told me that, I was like, oh man, I'm like, uh, I never really thought about it. It's like, a, they don't, there's no days off at the casinos. Right, right. Um, so when I saw that happening, I was like, all right, well, I need to now pivot into something else because you know, the comedy club I work with in the casino, that's not going to happen. So that money is going to be gone and everything else is, you know, sure to follow. And, you know, sure enough, within two weeks, you know, every contract I had was just out the window. Right. Um, so that's when I reached out and I talked to you about it a little bit. Um, I'm working over at a golf course now for Jay Ewan, who was a uh, another Hamilton High School alumni. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's definitely been, you know, a little stressful. It's not exactly you know, the business I wanted to be in or where I thought I would be at the end of, you know, the middle to end of 2020. But, you know, it's really worked out. Like I got to, you know, rekindle this old relationship with a, with a friend of mine I hadn't talked to in five or six years. And then I, uh, um, I also spent a lot of time like, and that's the one thing I like about working with my hands is I can spend a lot of time thinking, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and that can go one way or the other way. But like, you know, it started to got me thinking and that's where this podcast came from and i was spending so much time trying to make money and you know produce stuff for other people that i didn't have any time to produce anything that like i really really wanted to do right right i also say during this time like and reinventing yourself we're talking about um how do you re um create yourself where you have value like my job, for example, well, my main job as an assistant principal is dealing with discipline. Mm-hmm. There's not a whole lot of discipline that's going on in the schools right now because the class sizes are smaller. You got half right. the population, yada, yada, yada. So I have to figure out a way to make myself become valuable. So with my skill set, I, you know, technology and all that stuff, I started, you know, going to classes and hooking up, you know, remote classes with these teachers and start moving into a space where I'm doing professional development on that end of things. Uh, I think a lot of people during this time, especially if you work with companies, like you need to really assess like what value can you bring to that that company at, at during this time. Otherwise, you know, what's the reason yeah, you, you're, you're, you're out. Tomorrow, <laughs> right? you're out the door, right? And I learned that early in my education career. Like and you know, I coach multiple sports. So I was like, I, I don't have tenure they could easily cut my TV media, could go out the window to right. cut my job. But I wanted them to at least think, well, 
if I get rid of Josie, I got to get rid of hire a new basketball coach, a new soccer coach, a new baseball coach. Like so, the value that I I, I, I never to, knew that's why you coached all those beyond, <laughs> right, It was beyond the classroom. So, and you can take that philosophy in any sector that you're doing. So you've got to really figure out how do you create value for that for that company so that it makes it hard for them to replace you. At the very least, they might shift you somewhere else, especially in this you know the time that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's. It, it just it baffles my mind. Like even now, like we were on, uh, we were home back in the spring. Like the nurses, right? What are they doing? You're not in school, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to. I was talking to my nurse, I said, we people like us, we got to reevaluate us. Uh, you know, reinvent ourselves to create value. So maybe you're doing some health lessons and and getting things you know out to the population that way. And I um, you know she took some things and ran with it. So it's about again. If, if things were normal, but especially now, like you're working for an organization, you need to create value in yourself. But then the flip side, like you did, it's time for you to try stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's time for you to create your own podcast. It's time for you to do the thing that you knew you wanted to do, but you just never really did. Yeah. And the thing I value about what you said is that at this point, your podcast, you're not chasing money. Like before you were chasing money to, to you know, and trying to figure out what you wanted to do and you kind of liked it. But is a freedom now that you have. You can do whatever you want with your podcast, and mm-hmm. you just don't have to worry about. It. Like that's huge. The only thing I can't do is curse because my mom will yell at me. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but but yeah, you're. I mean, yeah, you're right about that. And like, and it, it's it, it's cool because in in other times, like you know, downtime that I would have, where you know, some of those like you know, bad thoughts can creep in, and you know, you start getting down and. You know, you're worried about, you know, whatever, the economic situation or, you know, you know, the coronavirus or the, 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 the political nature of what's going on right now. But instead, in that time, like I'm thinking about like, all right, well, like what, what kind of guests do I want to have? Mm-hmm. You know, who should I reach out to? Um, mm-hmm. Who should I talk to? When should I record? When should I release? When should I do all this stuff? And, and um, you know, before when I was doing all that stuff before and it, it was like I felt really – like weighted down by social media and mm-hmm. I'm sure you can probably relate to that a little bit, but it's just like, you know, I'm checking like, well, what time should I post it? Or, you know, if I make a Facebook post, I have to do an Instagram post and I've decided with this podcast, I'm just going to record and I'm going to send it out and that's it. If people listen to it. Great. If people don't listen to it, whatever. Right. Right. There's freedom in that. Though. Yeah. I mean, that's how basically I, we operate with the empowerment perspective group. It was, I record it. You know, and see what happens, and I'll put it out there. I might throw some ads out there. I might throw some things out there. But at the end of the day, people listen to it. They listen to it. They don't. They don't. The thing that I'm learning now is, though, because we I started breaking it down into seasons. So what I'm learning now is you never know who's listening to you and mm-hmm. who might need to hear what you have to say. And I made a post about that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I saw that a couple of days ago, right? Yeah, it's just weird. Like, and then just. You never know, like so many people of the, you know, my today's lessons and the stuff that I put, the content that I put out, there's people out there that really need to hear it, right? And it, and the, the problem that we have in our profession that we're doing is here is that a lot of times we don't see the fruits of our labor, right? We don't know who we're really impacting until you've had an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with somebody. Like in education itself, like I've talked to thousands of kids, right? And I, at the end of the day, unless a student like you or somebody else comes back and say, you really had an impact on my life, I don't really know if right. I'm doing a good job or not. So you never really know. Like somebody might be listening to this right now and really needed to hear what we're, what we're talking about. Even if it's one or two people. Like, mm-hmm. To me, that's worth it. And this this just keeps me going. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. I always uh, kind of like that about your, uh, your attitude and stuff like that too. Um, so how are you... Uh, uh, I'm interested to know how how have the students been reacting to uh, how all this thing has been going on. Actually, uh, a couple kids who work at our golf course are Hamilton High School students, alumni now. But I think a couple of them are still in school. But how how are they adjusting to like the whole you know e learning and and coming in and going out and stuff like that? It's interesting you should say that because the Empowerment Perspective podcast season five is all about student voices. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm plugging my show on your show. That's what I do here. That's the so, whole point of podcasting, man. That's the whole point of getting on other people's shows. So I'm actually interviewing a bunch of students and a bunch of kids to get their perspective, not only on the coronavirus, but also the social injustice that's going on. All Because as educators and as adults, we have this 
idea that we know what kids want and know what they feel and they you know we try to direct them and we very rarely give them a voice so i'm talking about i'm talking to nine-year-olds 10-year-olds all the way up to 18 year olds to let them know uh at least to hear their voice so that's coming out soon but um just in general speaking like part a huge part of it kids are going to respond how their parents respond right so in my house like we talk about coronavirus we're careful wash our hands and stuff but we're not making it like a huge deal Mm-hmm. Right. So the the anxiety with them, they, they respect it. They know it. But the anxiety there is not not there. So a lot of these kids are coming in because parents are doing just that. They're they're fine with it. They know they got to wear the mask. It's part of the rules of the school. They put their mask on and, and they're pretty much just being, them, you know, within themselves a little bit. You can still see that, you know, they're afraid to get close to people. Right. Part of it is because we're also drilling in social distance in their mind and stuff like that. But. They're adjusting to this new normal, but it's not as as crazy, at least in my building. It's not as crazy as, as one would expect it to be. Um, what, what's certain, the age group you you have again? I'm at the elementary school. Got it. So I have okay. second grade to, to fifth grade. So, yep. um, but they're respecting. It's a little bit, it's it's difficult to, to keep them socially distanced because naturally at that age, they want to be around and hug and touch, but we're doing a great job with it. Um, and the system that we have at our elementary school is a little bit easier to, to, to manage. Whereas the high school, you're switching classes, you got all these kids, that, you know, going in and out. But for the most part, everyone's probably pretty much doing their, their part and trying to, to respect it. Um, I think the interesting part is a lot of these students miss learning, right? Mm. And then they now that they're back into it, they're really trying to soak up information and try to take some of this stuff serious. And like students that before which may have been a problem uh didn't come to school didn't want to participate they're now actually like locked in a little bit so um there's some good in, in that but for the most part these kids are they're complying or doing what they need to do i um, mean again a lot of it has to do with how the adults handle and, and present the situation you know so that's a huge part of it. yeah what do you attribute to the kids who may have had a problem or you know didn't want to learn before is it like a in, in a different met is there like a different method of teaching or do you think it's just that it's you know it shook up a little bit so maybe there's like a, a spark or something like that i mean if we're talking about traditional education in, in a traditional sense like everything was normal um there's so many factors that go into why students don't participate whether it be their home life whether it be um their own view of school it might be the relationship between the teacher it right. might be the relationship between the kids and it might just boil down to they just don't they're not interested in the content right um, so there's a lot of those, those factors that that are involved in it um they, the key like teaching is a is an artistry like once you get people hooked you know what i'm saying they'll, they'll buy in um like my class for example and it's, it's different i know it's not english and it's not it wasn't math and anything but the way that i kind of try to approach it was one i need you to relate to me on a human level mm-hmm. so that you felt comfortable coming in my classroom um but two i try to make it interesting you know for you to to want to learn these things and then i'm trying to teach you because i have high school students teach you about life skills on on the back end of that so i think with that combination Kids, I had kids that were quote unquote the bad kids of the school that would come after school to complete work for me, and I had to kick them out of the classroom because of that relationship was our was developed um, on that level. And I think a lot of that, especially you know, gets to middle school and high school, a lot of it is is about who you can connect to. And if a mm-hmm. kid, the kid's not going to like from people that they don't learn. They're not going to learn from the people they don't like. Sorry. Um, so that relationship building is a huge piece to education. Yeah, I um. You know, I, I always talk about, you know, the, the TV media class I had, well, the classes I had with you. Um, I don't think, you know, other than that, you know, the time I spent down in D.C., I don't think there was like a chunk of like my high school career that was, you know, played a more important role than than that class. Like, you know, from learning how to work like in, in groups with people. And then also it was I think the first time that I was ever in a, in a setting where I was working with people from like, you know, different different age groups, too. Like, I, you know, I was a freshman in that class and I was working with kids who were like 18 and, you know, 14, don't really know much about anything. Like, I'm, you know, barely out of middle school and I'm having to like collaborate with these kids and, you know, everyone was at like a different level. And, um, you know, one thing that a technique that you used on me that now I use when I'm training people on the golf course or in, in other places where let me let me know if you remember this, too. I'd be interested to see if you remember this. So. 
I expressed interest in you to working on the morning announcements. And I wanted to I wanted to run the camera. I wanted to run the switcher. I want to run this. I want to run that. And you were like, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to plus play on this VTR machine when I tell you to. And then you're going to hit stop when I tell you to stop. And then I did that. Well, the first thing I think you actually had me do is you taught me how to roll, roll <coughs> wires. And I rolled wires, I think, for a week. Mm-hmm. And then you put me in there to the VTR machine. And then I went to, I, you know, I don't remember the order, but I went, then I went to the audio board. Then I went to the technical director position. Then I went to graphics. And then you brought me out on the floor. And then I did all that stuff out there. And then eventually I was directing it. And I didn't really realize at the time, I was so pissed that you only let me <laughs> hit the, the play and pause button. But um, I didn't realize you were like, you know, training me on how to use everything because I didn't know how to use any of it. I mean, if you take, because I coach, right? So what you're essentially asking me to do that back then was teach you how to, to do a 360 slam dunk the first time you stepped on the basketball. You don't know nothing about the game. You just want to go up there 360 slam dunk the ball. I have to at least put you into the arena. You're not on the court. You got to be in the arena to see what is going on um, in there. And, uh, you know, the, the the wrapping of the wires and all that stuff, it's, it served the purpose. Now you never forgot that lesson to this day. You know how to, to wrap a, you know wrap these wires. You should correctly. see the wires I have in my apartment, man. It is perfect. But people don't understand. Like you, <laughs> if you mess it up, right? You're gonna you're gonna break these wires, and then you're not gonna have a show, mm-hmm. right? So these wires are extremely important. So putting you in the, the space to be able to at least see what's going on, and then all right, I'll get you a little closer to the to the bench. All right, now you're sitting on the bench. I might put you in for a minute or two, but by the time I get done with you, you're going to be doing a 360 slam dunk when you're ready to do it. Um, I do the same technique with my daughters. Like my daughters were heavy into slime and they wanted to do a slime convention. So what did I do as a parent? I said, all right, you need to know what it looks like. So we drove up to Boston. I let them go to the slime convention. All right, hold, on, hold on one second. Hold on one second. You're yep. saying slime? <laughs> yeah, you know, slime, like, you know, the slime. Like yeah, like Nickelodeon they, slime or Nickelodeon slime type stuff. Like they was heavy into that. So I said, let, <laughs> I'll let you, you know, I want you to feel it. I want you to see what it looks like to, to know what you're up against. And okay. then we can now break it down into, can you really do this type thing? So, um, it's a, you know, it's, I think it's a, you, you got to learn how to walk before you can run and not that type of thing. Um, a lot of people just want to jump into stuff and, Think they're going to be awesome at it. like podcasting like you know what i'm saying like if you've never heard of a podcast before you're not going to know what to do with it if you don't know how to hook up a microphone you like what what's the point of you even trying to say oh i got a million user or a million followers and all that stuff like, mm-hmm. you, you gotta get to that level and there's there's value in that you know the other thing i was looking at was your work ethic right so can if mm-hmm. if i can trust you to wrap these buyers the way I want you to wrap them and then do these things, I can trust you to run a show at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was a huge lesson in that. And then, you know, kind of going back to what you were saying before, like, I was interested in it too. And that's like, you know, if I wasn't that interested in it and I just wanted to do it and you were like, hey, you got to wrap these wires, I've been like, you know, this, this probably isn't for me, but I, I was interested in it. You know, obviously I still am. Um, and I, I guess that's what kind of gave me the motivation. But, you know, we do we do the same thing on the golf course. Like, you know, we, we get somebody, you know, they come in new and all they want to do is is ride the tractor. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, well, you know, you're not in your 40s so we're not going to put you on the tractor yet. You're a young guy. So here's a weed whacker. Right. And if you can start it, if you can string it, if you, you know, can do everything, you know, we tell you to do it once, we tell you to do it twice. And then if you, you can do it without, you know, missing anything or being lazy then we'll start training you on another machine and then another machine and then another machine and another machine and then and then you're the guy that we're like hey we need something done and we need something done right so mm-hmm. we're gonna ask you to do it and then you know it goes from there you have to learn how to master your craft i mean at the end of the day whether you're talking sports whether you're talking about a job like learning as much as you possibly can and then and the only way that that was going to happen for you is to put you in a situation where you it doesn't require a whole lot of thought but you, it gives you the space to to really see the big picture and start mm-hmm. focusing on the on the bigger the bigger picture. Um, whether you're an educator, whether you're in any field, like you've got to learn to master your craft. Even in my position, I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly 
trying to make myself uncomfortable and, and, and trying to, you know, uh, master it, master it, being an administrator. Um, but that I don't learn until I'm in a space where, you know, I've gotten, you know, wrapping wires down. I can now focus on trying to, to grow um, is where, you know, the, the situations that I'm trying to create for, for myself. I mean, I think it's, it's powerful and for people to do that. So um, the other thing I liked about it was that you did it. Um, your, again, your work ethic, like you, you took pride in the fact that you were wrapping these, these wires, right? Um, there's a story uh, that I'm going to steal from, I think Russell Simmons talked about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, the guy came up to him and he said he wanted to be like this mega Hollywood superstar. Like, and he's expecting Russell Simmons to help him get to this this place. And he was like, well, I want you to do is I want you to go to California. So he goes to California and he said, I, I got you a job at an ice cream shop. And he was like, I'm trying to make movies. I ain't trying right. to serve ice cream. But he said, I want you to really focus on your customer service. So the guy goes in, sells these ice cream with a big smile on his face. A guy comes in and was like his his demeanor and attitude was contagious. So he's like, I want you to come work with me in this clothing store. So then he goes and he starts dressing and he carries that same work mentality. Then, he, then a, a director comes in and takes him to a party. And he came with that same energy. And then eventually, obviously, you get the point. He gets to the point where he's now was directing, you know, these big movies and things. But it all started from that ice cream shop and his work ethic and how he approached uh, that situation. So I don't care whether you're the low man on the total pole. If you come to work with a certain attitude and so certain focus, it's going to get recognized. And then you're going to, and then you want to grow and learn. And this, you just keep uh, building up. The problem is a lot of people expect things to be handed to them. And, and you, you know, when you get up to that level, you fail because you're not ready for it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it is a, it is a process to it all. So it's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, it, uh, and, and yeah, I don't know if it's, I, I guess, how it was raised or, or, or why I do that, but it, it, it's it, it's funny. If you, if you give me something that I'm like completely not interested in at all, like I can mm-hmm. I cannot stand to be in it. But then, you know, I had people, you know, ask me, you know, uh, even when I was doing the video business, you're like, oh, you know, did you go to film school? Did you do this? Did you do that? And, you know, people ask me about the podcast, like, oh, like, how do you know how to set up all that stuff? And, and part of it was, you know, I, I would buy a small piece of equipment and then figure it out, figure out how to get it to work with the other stuff I had. And then it was, all right, now buy another piece of equipment because I want to do this. And, and it all turned, uh, you know, through YouTube videos, reading forums and just like tons and tons of research to decide what I wanted to buy, how much I could spend. And then um, a lot of it was like a workflow thing too. Like I, I wanted the workflow to be seamless and easier. And that's kind of how it, it all it all got put together. The other thing is that the people got to realize that their current space is not your resting space, right? So when you go into whatever position, like I know I don't like being assistant principal. I hate dealing with discipline. I, I can't stand it. But I know that this is not my final spot, right? You know what I mean, and I know yeah. I, I'm going to grow to this next area. So when you go into any job, like if you go with it in the mentality like this is all I'm ever going to do and I hate it, it's, I hate. I feel sorry for you. Like you just got to know that this is only a moment in time. It's not your final resting spot if you don't want it to be. Um, and then have that mentality of, of, of growth to go into other areas. Um, it's, it's huge and it's important. Um, but I try to take a piece of every situation and then learn from it and develop relationships and develop skills in, in those those arenas. And I think you know the number one thing that I've learned in, in that process is how to network with people. Networking is huge. If there's anything that I can tell my younger self is that you need to learn how to network correctly. Never mind how to point a camera in the right direction and all that stuff, but learn how to network and learn how to fail are the two major things that I, I would tell my younger self mm. for sure. Yeah, you are. You're you're the network king, man. Always saying yes too. That's the one thing I always like about uh, Dr. Josie. He's like, anytime you ask him something, he's in. You know, if I Why can not? do it. I, I try to do it. People think I'm crazy. You doing too much. You have time. You got time for what? Make time for what you want to make time for at the end of the day. Yeah, I remember another podcast uh, that I that I had you on the Surfside Recovery. I think it was the Surfside podcast that you came on, and uh, we were talking about. You know, maybe it was uh, one of the early empowerment perspective podcasts when I when I came over to your place. Uh, mm-hmm. But I was like asking you, you know, how you you fit 
time into your into your day for like doing all the stuff you're doing and and you said something to me i'm gonna i'm gonna butcher how you said it but it was like you know just think about all the wasted time you have in the day like say it's you know 10 minutes here 10 minutes there 10 minutes there if you could just start allocating you know small intervals of time you know that over a longer period of time will 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 grow yeah the wasted minutes i found out i was wasting six to eight hours a day Six to eight hours a day. That's a nice sleep. It's a nice sleep. It's so much stuff that you could get done in that six to eight hours. Now, I was, I was being in, insane with it. Like, all right, the time I actually went to the water fountain, got a drink, whatever. Or, like, I was over the top with it. But it still broke down to six to eight. By the time, you know, I watch the news, that's a half hour. If I watch the, the world news, that's another hour. <laughs> like, there was this, you know what I mean? It easily adds up. So what I decided to do is... I need to at least cut this in half. Like I still, you know, need downtime. Everyone needs downtime and things of that nature. But if I could get four hours of extra work in, I, by all means, like right now it's six o'clock. Probably I would be watching. Why not do a podcast? <laughs> like why not? Like, yeah. what, I could get my news somewhere else. So I think a lot of people waste a whole lot of time of their day, and they're not maximizing their time. If you figure out a way to do that, you, there's so much more that you can accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's great, man. And, and like, you know, I, 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 with this coronavirus and, you know, all the other stuff that's going on in the world is it's kind of made me realize more, more so than I guess maybe in the past of how, you know, finite, you know, life can be. And that, you know, I really want to try to get, you know, really squeeze, like squeeze as much as I, I possibly can out of it. Like while, you know, while I'm still breathing, you know, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, so let's get into some nitty gritty stuff. What do you? What's on your mind? What's on? What when you wake up during the day and something is really, really bothering you, like right now? Like, what's the big thing right now that's on your mind? The big Could thing. A- the big thing that's. Uh, <sighs> yeah, I'd say the 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 political system in this country is really, really starting to upset me. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you you listened to the podcast I did with uh, with Darby, right? Yeah, yep. me and me and him got into it, and I, I uh, like not you know into it as a, in a fight, but we re- we really got into it. And I, the one thing that really bothers me and that I kind of see in the world right now is that you're not allowed to change your mind about things that you thought in the past, mm-hmm. right? And you get crucified for it if if you know you, you thought one way you know, a number of years ago, and then through whatever experience you had, you realized that you were wrong or you, you changed your mind about it. And, um, you know, when I was younger, I, I would, I would say I was definitely like, you know, pretty super Republican. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, party line, you know, straight as it was just because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And as mm-hmm. I've gotten older, like I, you know, I've, I've been swaying like back and forth and it's like, you know, I don't want anybody to think of me differently because this is how, like, I, I like I thought when I was when I was younger. You know, and mm-hmm. um, I, 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 I was talking to him about. In the, I live in the second con- congressional district of New Jersey, and it's Amy Kennedy and Jeff Andrew. And mm-hmm. Kennedy's platform, as I've seen, is Jeff Andrew used to be a Democrat, now he's a Republican. That's why you should vote for me. Mm-hmm. And Van Drew's campaign is. She's stuck up, spoiled, and entitled. So you should vote right. for me. <laughs> I know that was a mouthful, but like that, that, that was my vent right there. Yeah, I get it. I, I, the, the, I want to go back to one of the things you said is that I think this people in general try to put you in a box, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then that's why they're so uh, against you moving outside of that box, right? And they give you crap for moving outside of that box when you flip parties or whatever the case may be. And I start thinking about like, you know, why do people put other people in a box? It's easier for you to, for me to deal with you if I know what I'm dealing with, right? right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, as much as I can, I'm going to put you in this box, whether it be a Republican box, whether it be a Democrat box, whether it be whatever box, I'm going to put you in that box, and I, I can deal with you and I can swallow it. I can argue with you, but when you start moving and you start growing outside of those, those areas, it's harder for me to, to, to deal with you, and it's harder for me to, to process who you are and how I should be able to deal with you. Um, you know, I look at that, you know, to go back to the educational thing and my own personal experiences, like the teachers were trying to put me in this box. And then the more that I try to get outside of that box, the more he tried to put me back right. into it. So, um, 
you know, people are just, uh, you know, they're creatures of habit and they're just used to things being, you know, you know, that tunnel vision and I can deal with that, you know, and the way I get over it, I don't really care what people think, you know I mean? It is what it is. You can hate me if you want, you can like me if you want, and then they, they, they don't, I'm not giving you that power over me to make me feel a certain kind of way um, about how I feel, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's, even when I look at this, the political landscape now and people picking sides and like, everyone's trying to jam everybody into a box that they're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. That be who they are. Yeah, I um I go I go I go back and forth. I go I, I go one way that I want to get super involved and try to make a difference. Or I go the other way where I just don't care anymore. And it's like it's not really and that was like, you know, my, my philosophy over the past several years has been it doesn't matter who's in office. My, you know, my personal life isn't, it hasn't changed that much since, you know, Clinton was in office when I was a baby. You know, it's, it's pretty much gone on the trajectory it's gone on uh, from, I guess, you know, people around me and like the actions, uh, you know, I've taken. And I know that's not the case for everybody, but that's, you know, kind of the situation that, that I'm in. That's exactly how I feel about it. Um, and I tell people all the time, like, I vote because people die for me to have the right to vote. Um, at the end of the day, my life has been relatively the same since presidents and presidents and presidents. Um, the other piece of it is I'm not a fan of complaining about stuff that I'm not involved in. Right? I'm not overly political. Right. And I can sit here and complain about it. But if I'm not in that system to try to change it, uh, what, what am I going to complain about? It for? Right. So I complained about education for a while. I decided to be a part of it and try to make a change in, in it. I, I get people want to voice their opinion. I get protests and things of that nature, but you're not going to change anything if you're not involved. In it. Mm-hmm. So you got to make that decision. So for me, you know, politics, I, I get the importance of it. I'm not downplaying it, but for me, I'm like, you know, I, I can't complain about it because I'm not doing anything about it to, to complain of, other than voting. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the system is, is broken. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's and, and that that's kind of how I feel too. And I, and it, you know, when you ask me the question, what's been bothering me recently? It's like you know the, you know, an, another answer is not really not that much. You know, mm-hmm. like it, everything's pretty good now. Like uh, you know, I got you know a new apartment. I'm living with my girlfriend. Everything you know, my family's going great. You know, my brother had a baby. It's like you know, got a good job. I really don't have much to complain about. But if you know, if there is something, it just. I think the thing that frustrates me is is it's so apparent that the system broken and everyone just wants to be like this guy will fix it or this guy will fix it and it's like no no we say that every four years and it's still not fixed so what makes you think it's going to get fixed again right and then you run the the um problem of which systems are they trying to you are relying on them to fix because there's more than one system that's broken you can look at the educational system the economic system you can look at uh, you know, political systems, they're all so broke. Many systems, everything is just, <laughs> it, it, everything's not meant for everybody and everything yeah. is broken to somebody to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and we're sitting here asking somebody to care about something that you care about, but they may not care about. Yeah. Know, or it might be working for them and it ain't working for you. And that was something I said to Darby the other night is that it's, it's really hard, uh, you know, to get somebody to care about something that they don't, you know, they don't experience, you know, like why I'm trying to come up with a good, a good metaphor on the fly, but, uh, you know, why, why would I care about, we'll do a bad metaphor. Why would I care about the, uh, you know, the restaurants on, you know, uh, South street in Philadelphia, you know, mm-hmm. the restaurants in South street in Philadelphia have been terrible and they've been terrible for years. I don't live, I don't live, I don't live in Philadelphia. Why, why would I care about what's going on there? You know, it makes sense. Um, but also uh, on the flip side, I get the, the bigger picture, um, especially because I have daughters. So I have to care about certain systems that I know that they're going to mm-hmm. be in, involved in. Um, but again, I have to pick and choose what system or lane that I can impact with my skill set. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, 
Yeah, I just it's a, it's a tough call. Um, there are certain things that I personally obviously care about me personally, but I think my experiences in in this country has been hasn't changed. So like if you you kind of learn how to navigate those waters, and you know it it comes to a point where which fight do you want to have at the end of the day, um, and then who who do you want to have it for? Because you know the fight that I'm fighting today is not for me. I know change is not happening tomorrow from because of the stuff that I did. Mm. What I'm fighting for is the generations that are coming up after me. I have to be selfless enough to know that this is this fight isn't for me. It's mm. not changing tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's you know I was I was saying saying this to, to Darby too. It's, it's it's really you know it's hard. It, and I think the example I used was pretty poor, but. <laughs> No, like, I got it though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like it's it, it's it, it's just it's so hard for me to like, you know. It's just it's it's hard for me to like even you know wrap my my mind around it. You know, mm. it's it's you know just you know difficult. You know, I don't know if you know. I just I don't really know what I you know what to do or if I you know I can do anything or if I should do anything. You know, it's just like it's like a you know the you know the, the racial issues in this country. It's like it, it's really tough because you don't you don't want to say the wrong thing. You know, because you get the wrong you say the wrong thing once and it's it's over and you, you know you don't want to be insensitive or anything like that you know it's true um it's it's a difficult space to be in if you look at it from that perspective um what i try to tell people is that the one thing that we all have in common is that we all feel we all have feelings right so we relate to each other on that very fundamental level you could recognize when somebody's hurt you could recognize when somebody's mad and the simple fact that you recognize that and acknowledge it and don't judge them because they feel a certain way is an easy way to have a con because you can understand everyone understands feelings everyone that's how you learn from when you're a baby mm -hmm. um, so having those conversations at least to start the conversation of recognizing your pain um you may never understand you probably will never understand what it's like to be a black male in this country and i don't expect you to mm -hmm. but you can understand pain you can understand hurt. You can understand frustration. So, you know, we can at least deal with each other on that that fundamental level. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of people, well, I'll speak for myself, I, I just want people to recognize that. And you see on my Facebook page, no, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. At least acknowledge that I see that you're not okay. You know what I'm saying? And I understand that you'll never know what it feels like to be me. Um, and it's it's not easy, you know, and when people look at me, I, I kind of roll with the punches. I'm kind of laid back type things, but my anxiety is through the roof all the time. And it has always been. Mm -hmm. um, so when I try to explain to people how I feel, um, I had a couple of female teachers ask me that. And I said, all right, here's the equivalent of how I feel every day that I walk out my house. I said, imagine you went to dinner with friends it's nighttime, you're in Philly, you park down this alley, you got to walk down this dark alley by yourself. As a female, you want to feel certain anxiety, like you want to be nervous. You know, you're looking over your shoulder, who's looking at you and those things. I said, that feeling, bottle that feeling, and that's how I feel every single day I walk out of my house. I've learned to deal with it. I've learned not to express it. But I, once I said that, the light bulb kind of goes off because they understand feelings. You know, they, can, they can at least relate to how I feel about the situation. So it's, it's tough, man. It's, a, it's definitely interesting um, in all facets. Um, even with my personal dealings with police, I respect the police. I respect the, their jobs and things of that nature, but my experiences are different than yours. Like for example, when you get pulled over, what's going through your mind? Uh, I hope I don't get a ticket. It's really what is it, that's that's the first thing that's going through my mind. Yeah, I hope, right, I, I hope I don't get a you don't ticket. get a ticket. What else you think? Uh, I mean, you know, you if have, you asked me five years ago, ticket. I would be wondering where you know what I had in the car. You know, if I had any. You what know. are we talking about today? <laughs> oh, today. That what's your your thought process? Man, it's really the same thing. It's like I hope I have an FOP card on me, and I hope I don't get a ticket. That's that's really your license, your registration out, yeah. all those things, right? Yeah. So I've had an experience um, coming out of college. It's come across the bridge. My tail light was busted. Um, me and my friend get pulled over. Cops pull us over. 
they got guns drawn out on us. We got up hard the whole nine. They said we look like somebody. So that was my initial, like my experience from back in the day. So I got pulled over maybe a month ago. Um, actually, sorry, it was more than that. It was like a year ago. I'm coming from work. I got my jacket in the back seat with my black wallet in the back seat. So instead of my mental process of I need to get my license and registration and, you know, hope I don't get a ticket, I'm thinking if I reach in this back seat right now, grab this black wallet out of this jacket, is this cop going to think it's a gun? Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't think holding my hands on the steering wheel, asking for permission to get back in the back seat to grab this wallet just so that I can make it home, you know, based upon my experiences in the past. It's not even an experience that I'm watching on TV. Like I, I lived it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So um, it's it's tough to navigate those those experiences on a on a daily basis. Um, you know, it's 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 tough, but yeah, it, it, I, it's really yeah. such a like like crazy thing altogether too because it's like all right like you you know you have you know you have you, you have that prior experience you know personal experience in your life and uh you know my, my father was in law enforcement and um i remember him telling me you know one of the you know the scariest things you could really do as, a, as an officer is you know a routine traffic stop you know because mm -hmm. you go up and you have absolutely no idea what's going to be going on in you know, in the car, you don't know who you're pulling up to. You don't know what they got going on. And you just, uh, you're going up, you're going up blind. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really, it's like a, it's like a crazy thing to try to give a human being like that, that power and responsibility. Mm -hmm. But like on the other side, somebody, somebody has to do it. You know, we, we can't not have them, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's just it's like tough. it's like I've I've been thinking about that a, a lot recently, and just like trying to look at it from you know every every angle. I think the missing piece a lot of people are missing today is that there's a historical element that goes into you know yep. the black community when it comes to police officers. I mean, we're talking about going back to enslavement times and, and the authority. If you look at the overseer, they were on a horse with a whip. You go to Philadelphia, guess what the cops today are on? Horses and yep. like, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole history that it's not just Kaepernick or George Floyd or right. things that are happening right now. They, we talking generations and generations of dealing with, uh, you know, people of authority in a negative light. Um, even to switch gears, like you can even take it from an educational standpoint. You know I mean, my experiences and the, the black uh, community's experience with the educational system from a historical uh, perspective, was it's not what everyone else, you know, other people have experienced. So there's naturally going to be some tension that, that existed. Um, and I don't think people, I think people are just looking at the here and now and say, oh, why do you do that? Why do you, like, there's so many layers to this thing that uh, to really get to the root and understanding of it, we got to go back, 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 back. Um, but I don't think a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I de definitely understand that from like a, you know, the historical end. So do you, do you, what do you think we can do, you know, either, you know, on an individual level, uh, you know, community level or, you know, national state, you know, whatever level you want to talk about, in order to move this forward because you know this has been going on i mean really since the foundation of the country and and longer you know in other nations and stuff like that and you know it, it seems like another event happens and then we you know it's opened up again right and then mm -hmm. another event happens and then it's you know just compounding and compounding and compounding and compounding and like i you know i don't have an answer you know i don't have an answer what direction that we should you know we should start to move in or or uh th there's no like we'll pass this bill and then it'll all be okay you know it's it's way you know way i guess deeper deeper than that but you know what do you, what do you i mean where, where where or what do you think you know starts needs to start happening I think we're at a pivotal point right now um, because the voices that you're hearing right now are young. There's a lot of young people that are out there that are voicing their opinions. I think in order for things to change, um, those young people and those voices have to go into these these spaces, the educational spaces, the political spaces, uh, you know, the economic space, all these spaces in order for the, the system to begin to, to change. 
Um, Because what's happening right now and essentially is a lot of people are asking the same people that are that they feel are oppressing them. You're asking the oppressor to change the oppression. And it, it, it's not, it doesn't, the, the recipe for disaster. It just doesn't so, work like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you, you have to move in those spaces to, to, to affect change. Um, you know, again, the, one of the reasons why I got into education, because there's not a lot of black males in education. Um, and I, I did, on a very minute level, if I want to change that, I have to be a part of the system. Right. Mm. And I have to be able to, to maneuver and, and, and work to try to change it within there. So I think you have to um, take these young voices and, 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 and place them into, you know, places that are actually going to impact the, the change that they want to see. Right now, everyone's on the outside of the fence barking at the dog. You know what I'm saying? Instead of you want the dog to stop barking, you got to get inside that fence and train the dog not to bark. So mm-hmm. um, I think that's, that's a huge, huge piece of it. Um, the other piece, I mean, it, it it's a tough situation, and uh, yeah, we dig into it. Like you're dealing with the capitalistic system, right? And capitalism thrives on a winner and a loser. Right. The system doesn't work without a winner and a loser. Somebody has to lose in order for capitalism really to work. So the question becomes, who's who's going to lose, right? So uh, even if you go in and change these systems, the the, the nature of capitalism is that I have to outperform somebody and it's everywhere. You know, the educational system, you got grades, you know, who has a hundred and who has a 50, you got like, there, there's so many things that need to kind of, I mean, there's good in that too. I mean, competition is good. Right. Too, yep. But yeah, and, time, you know, and it's a motivating factor to, you know, yeah. be better. So, leveling the playing field across the board for everybody would probably be the the cleanest way to do it but the hard part is there's so much stuff that has been done to so many people that the process of leveling the playing field in itself is going to be an impossibility um but it, it's going to take young people and it's, i believe this generation to to come together and to to impact um change on a, on a big level um, I look at, and it has to almost be rebel, like a rebel almost kind of like mm-hmm. you have to think differently than what currently is happening. And I look at, I do a lot of research about hip hop. Uh, you see on my shirt, but mm-hmm. I do a little presentation. Um, I look at how hip hop started. It was a bunch of kids and their voices. Um, the system said basically that you can't go to certain schools. You can't do certain things. And instead of complaining about it, these people, these kids made something out of nothing, literally. And it's grown to the point where these young people had a voice. Now, hip hop's probably one of the few musical genre and, and cultures that has transcended races. It has transcended genders. It has transcended almost everything. Um, and it has leveled the playing field for everybody who's interested in those things. And I think that for this to work, we have to have those young voices, that same spirit that these young people created hip hop um, to come in and redesign and reshape what should happen. And, you know, globally, it's a, it's, it's a pivotal moment right now. These young people have, have the opportunity. It's a matter of what you're going to do with it. Like, again, I, I get the protests. I understand all that, but, you can park outside of that fence all you want until you get inside the game. You're not going to really change much. Yeah, yeah. It just, you know, it makes me sad, man. You know, it's just like, it's just it's just a shame that this is, you know, the way it is. And, I, you know, I, I, you know, feel bad that, you know, like you or, you know, anybody else, they, they you got to feel like that when you're going to get, like, a, you know, milk from the store. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's like a... It's just and it, and people say you, know, you had the same opportunity as everybody else. Don't look at me and say I'm successful in things. I said, but you don't understand. Like when I still go into a store, I have a doctorate degree. You know, I'm successful, a business owner, yada yada yada. I go into a store, I still get followed. I walk down the street, people are still locking their car doors. Like it, that's that's my existence, right? So it's like, yeah, I I played the game. I've been successful at the game, but. 
I'm still getting treated as something else yeah. that I'm not. <laughs> yeah, Darby was saying that, you know, he had, uh, you know, he'd be in a suit and tie and he he was at like a, I think the story he told is he was at like a hotel, you know, having a meeting, you know, business meeting or whatever, like in, you know, lobby or room or whatever. And then somebody came in and asked him, you know, where is, you know, where's the elevator? Or, you know, what, like, like he worked there. And I'm like, I get that all the time. Like, I have my tie on, my badge on, and I might be going food shopping. And the people come, oh, you work here? All right, can you tell me where it took the, the I, nothing says shop right on me whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but you go ask me if, if I work there. I said, I, I, I'll, in my mind, I'm like, it's the badge. He think, you know, you got the badge that he think you work here. But um, it's just, it, it's a. And it's weird because you don't know. You don't know if it's the badge or not. You know, and that's, that's right. the thing that's weird. <laughs> and you also don't know if the person who's asking you, like what you know what was it what was it that actually triggered them to ask you the question you know no matter how trivial I did, this, I did this social experiment on um perception um my daughter is a cheerleader so i would drop her off at practice so the one day i would go there and i wore you know coming from work so i have my suit on and the tie and stuff and a guy comes up and has a conversation with me starts the conversation and he starts talking about politics i said okay so, so the next time i'm gonna go there I came from the gym. I had my gym shorts on. You know, I said, "All right, sit by the fence." A different person comes up to me. What do you think? The conversation? They start the conversation. With sports, yeah, conversation. obviously sports or something like that. This sports. is this is really interesting, by the way. So then I go the third time. I go with my Cowboys hat on. I got it to the side. I got some shades on. I might even put a little sag in my pants on purpose. Uh, so I go in there and I stand by the fence, and this lady comes up to me. What do you think? The conversation. <sighs> She probably said something about the Eagles. <laughs> that's, that's no, it wasn't sports related. Nope. Okay. Um, I, 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 I want to say she she probably asked you what what, what are you what are you doing there or something like that. No, she didn't ask that. But don't forget, my hat was cocked to the side. I got sunglasses on. Yeah, you know, a little sag in my pants. I I don't know. She now we now we're talking about hip hop music and drugs. <sighs> So, I, I mean, and I just did that, you know, as a social experiment. So I wonder when people just see me in the street dressed normally, like what is, and I'm assuming that they made these comments, conversations and based upon their perception of, of me, they didn't know that again, I, was, I have a doctorate and, you know, all these things of that nature. But when they saw me, that's what they see. They saw sports, they saw hip hop music they saw politics or whatever so on a normal day when i come up to somebody in my mind i'm like well what what is their perceived notion of, of me like are you afraid of me is that why you're locking your door or crossing the street to the other side you know, do you think i'm going to steal something that's why you're following me in the, in the story um and where does it come from like is it because you've had the experience of someone that looks like me that did these things or is it because you see it on tv or somebody told you about it um so these are the things that constantly kind of go through my mind so what i kind of try to do is i try to distort some people's uh perceptions like <laughs> i'll be in wawa and i might have that hat to the side and some glasses and sag on i'll intentionally look for somebody and buy their food or whatever it is that they um are, are purchasing and I won't let the, you know, uh, there might be three or four people down. I'll say I'm buying that person's stuff. And they'll look at me like some of them, the, the expression on their face is priceless. What, like the like the cashier at Wawa or whatever? No, the person that I bought it for. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Right? So, oh, so now, you, you tell them. You tell them that you're going to pay for it, like call it out in I'll line? I'll the cashier. I'll pay for it. They might be sitting next to me. There might be two or three persons right, down. Right, okay. But then once, and I'll intentionally wait around a little bit until they know that somebody bought it and they'll look around and the cashier will be like he purchased it and then the look on their face is like hey, <laughs> priceless and then eventually most of them say thank you or whatever and i said here's the deal like you have to now pay it forward to somebody else yeah that you would think that would never do something like that hmm. so i kind of try to just find these pockets it's kind of messing with people but i, I get an enjoyment <laughs> out of it so um, but it's a shame it, it, it really is a shame Mel. yeah i wonder too and you were you, you were you were saying um you know 
like what is it was it what you were wearing you know is it the color of your skin is it this or is it that and you know i wondered too how much you know what what part of it is also you know how we're wired as as human beings to be constantly like like evaluating things you know if you think you know in in this civilized state that we've been in as people hasn't been in grand total not really all that long you know, and living in these super close cities and, and the way we communicate with each other, it's a bit, such a rapid pace. And, you know, we got all this information, like all this news, just like bam, bam, bam in your face. And like, you know, we're, we're, we're wired to be evaluating the situations that are around us as threats, you know, at like a base level, like an absolute right. base level. And then you add all that other stuff on top of it. You know, and that just kind of compounds like the, you know, the fear and irrationality and, st- and things like that. I think a huge part of it, too, goes back to what we talked about earlier. People want to put people in boxes. Yep. It's yep. easier for me to deal with you as I see you as a thug or as an athlete or as as a politician. I, I can deal with you on those levels. But you come to me with 45 different outfits on and you talking about 45 different things. I, I can't wrap my brain around that. A lot of people can't wrap their brain around that. I don't want to deal with you. They're like, so, who's whose dad is that? Whose dad is that guy? Yeah, right. <laughs> now you don't want to have a conversation with me. Okay. Yeah, next time you go, you're not even gonna have anybody talk to you. They're just gonna go up and like, yeah, oh, we can't, well, we can't okay figure him out. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it, you know, not having conversations with people at certain points in time. So I don't know. It's a it's an interesting thing, but yeah, again, you you kind of learn to navigate those things and, and you it there's a concept called code switching uh, which basically means that you are one person in one environment and somebody different in another environment mm-hmm. and, and for me in my existence right now is i'm constantly code switching like when i go to work um i can only i can't be my 100 percent myself or if i then i go to this space i can't be 100 percent myself like i got to learn how to navigate these spaces so that i'm accepted in these spaces I've eventually learned to grow myself where I can relatively be the same person in all those spaces. But there's a lot of people that can't that can't do that, uh, especially young people and, and kids. And I tell teachers all the time, I said, imagine this. Here's this young kid. I always say he's coming from the black community because that's what I know. Um, who in there in the community, there's certain things that are indigenous to them, um, like call and response, like. Our community is big on, you go to church, the, the pastor says, can I get an amen? Somebody, the congregation responds back. You go to movie theaters, people talking to the screen. You go to, con- like, we're always, even in conversations when people are talking, we're always saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm yes. And we're all, there's a call and response that goes on. So well, do you, you have any idea why, I'm, to I'm, sorry to interrupt and, you, do you have any idea why that is? When you just settle that, like, what, like, the origin, the origin of that is? I mean, a lot of it goes back to, you know, Africa in ancient times where, where there are people were, you know, um, the call and response, is, it's, it's indigenous to, to that. Um, huh. Even with the, uh, you know, there were tribal um, communities that, you know, the drum and then you would imitate that with the dance or, you know, or you would have conversations and chants based upon what it was. Is this an indigenous thing that continues to, to go through? So you take somebody like that, a kid like that, and you put him into a school where now you're getting disciplined for calling out. So now I got a code switch, change who I am mm. to fit that system so I don't get in trouble. This is a minor example. So, I, I never, that never even crossed my mind at all. I was kind of like blown away with, by, by that. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. So I encourage, I try to encourage my teachers and, the way I taught was, if you have an answer, I'm okay with you calling now. If you're on topic, you're engaged with it. That's how you know. If that's how you learn, and that's indigenous to who you are, then good. I get trying to get other kids' voices and things of that nature. But now you take little Johnny, who's used to that, put him in that setting, and then you're going to discipline him on top of something that's natural to him. Mm-hmm. He's got to figure out how to navigate that space so he don't get in trouble. So I can't really be who I am in that space. Mm-hmm. So then now you go, and, it, and it's everywhere you go. You can even go classroom to classroom. Every classroom is different. Right. you got to learn to navigate the, those spaces. And yeah. it's just, there's yeah. a lot of things that's just so anti to 
what some people are used to. And I think it's so so hard for kids. I think I've kind of realized that in myself over the past, uh, you know, maybe two or three years that I'm really finally starting to become like you know comfortable with who I am, and you know, being able to be you know pretty much that same person whether. You know, I'm out to dinner with my girlfriend, you know, uh, at my parents' house, at work, you know, with my friends. Like, you're pretty much going to get, you know, mostly this, this the same person uh, all around. But I think it really took me a, a lot, you know, to be able to, to, to develop into that. Yeah, it's a lot of growing that needs to take place and a lot of experiences that need to take place in order for that to happen. So, you know, when people look at me and say, well, you've made it out and you've been successful and at, at doing it. it. It wasn't, it was painful. It wasn't easy. <laughs> right. You know? And it was trying to navigate these, these spaces and not letting the fact that people didn't want me in those spaces bother me. Right. So the, the road to whatever success is for me was completely different than somebody else that didn't have to go go through that that route and as a 43 year old man i'm still dealing with the same stuff um and trying to to navigate it and now i got daughters that are are navigating spaces differently one because they're female Mm -hmm. two they're mixed so that is a whole dynamic there that they got to navigate and and things of that nature so uh, you know the trick for me is trying to teach them how to be able to navigate those spaces Hmm. and still truly truly be who you are and that and you know people being who they are is 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 probably one of the things that i think i enjoy most about life too man is like people are so so interesting and complex yeah. and different and and you know one of my one of my favorite things about working in you know the landscape field i'm in and now is i work with a lot of guys from you know mexico central america south america and I learned how to speak Spanish at the first golf course I worked at just because I wanted to know right. more about them. You know, I wanted to know what kind of food they ate, what kind of music they listened to, you know, did they go to church? Did they do this? Did they do that? And it's like, you know, I learned a whole nother language really because I just wanted to ask these guys I was working with like questions about, you know, whatever country they're from. Like uh, at my old course, all the guys were from El Salvador. Before I worked at that golf course, I didn't even know El Salvador was a country. Literally, I had, had no idea it was a, even existed. You know, as an 18-year-old kid. Um, Crazy. One of my favorite things is to sit down with people and just listen to their experiences and just, you know, listening to some of their family things and, and um, just learning, man, and just learning about people and, and just appreciating their journey and appreciating the difference. And it's just like... I love it. Like, and then it, it, it awakens something in me to want to kind of experience those things. Um, and I learned that from like when I growing up, my family never traveled. You know, I think we went to DC one time and then, mm-hmm. um, I had the privilege of going to Greeks, um, and just learning that culture and just seeing people over there. Um, like my eyes, I, I question myself. I was like, I just want to learn about people because it was just fascinating to me. The most interesting thing for me in that situation was over there, everybody saw me as an American. I was the only black person probably within miles. And I was in this uh, place where you eat, like outdoor eating thing. And everyone came up to me, it was like American, American, American. Everywhere I went, you're American. And I dawned on me, like, I'm only black in the United States. Everywhere I went international, <laughs> and then I've been to talk to people, I'm American. Hmm. Color was only my personal experience was was only here, but getting to see people and to learn and just to learn their journeys and I love hearing about how you know even you know some Italian families have come from you know how their family came from Italy and maybe started from nothing and got to the and just learning about people is just like this is is really really interesting to me and then it kind of opens up my my view and you know there's a lot of similarities that people people go through and at the end of the day we all want the same thing we want a roof over our head we want money in our pocket we want food in our belly we want to be happy 
Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's really, yeah, it's really that's that 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 that's it. That you, you you summed it up perfectly, and you know, you know, when I was working at this this golf course with these guys, you know, and you know, I I would hear other people, you know saying like you know racial slurs and stuff to these you know hispanic guys or even like you know in high school in you know in hamilton we had a large hispanic you know population there and you know a lot of them were you know families of you know people who worked on you know the farms or you know in town or you know wherever and um and like the more i got to know these guys i'm like they're pretty much italians they go to church on sundays have these big family dinners and like all eat together and they they hang out and they talk and they bullshit and they drink and it's like this is like going over to my uncle's house it's like it's the only thing different is the language that they're speaking but that's that's really that that, that's really about it i mean you you summed it up perfectly man roof money food family and like to be happiness that's be happy at the end of the day and you want the best for your kids yep but uh what else is there you know um and just being able to celebrate the differences is is, is awesome. I mean, people got to know. I, I look at it this way. To, to make it really simple, like food, for example. Right? You don't eat the same food every day. Right? You eat Italian, Mexican. You might have Chinese. Like, you want different experiences. Right? You don't want <laughs> – like, I don't, this, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, some people that are so, so here, but – in other aspects of their life, they're okay with. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, know, you never really think you about that. You don't wear the same clothes every day. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to make it even that, that, that as simple as that. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It, well, it, it doesn't make any sense because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's, that's really what it is. Is It, it doesn't make sense because it, 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 <laughs> it, isn't, it isn't sensical. Listen, listen, man. I I really appreciate the uh, the conversation we had. Um, you know, I know it you know it helped me out a lot, and I, I really appreciate you know everything you've done for me. You know, in the past, present, and I'm sure you know stuff you may help me out with along the road. But you know, really, just being honest too. You know what I mean? I think uh, you know having more conversations like this with people in the world like might ultimately make it like a better place for us to all to all live in. You know. Right, for sure. I mean, we just, we just gotta get in a space to listen to other people's stories and try to have empathy for their stories and their journey. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and say everybody's perfect. There's messed up people everywhere, but um, to be able to just listen um, and appreciate the differences is a huge thing. But um, I said it before, like I'm super proud of you and and the things that you're doing and you know the, your 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 personal journey and to see your growth and stuff like that is is, is amazing um, to me. I think we might be telepathically connected somehow because <laughs> I, I was literally watching Kyle's uh, podcast and then you text me like, hey, I'm like yo, I'm like watching this podcast right now. Do you know, like, you got some kind of tracking device on me, uh, which is, which is kind of cool in itself, but. Um, yeah, man. Anytime you need anything, for sure. I definitely, if I can, uh, be there for you for sure. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And uh, you know, obviously, likewise to you too. I want to, I want, I want to get you down here and you know, check out the studio and see what kind of what kind of tips you got. But all this stuff you see here is because of the stuff that Mister Josie at the time, Mister, taught me back in the the halls of Hamilton High. Yeah, but, uh, and I owe my college professor. Um, for your wire wrapping because that's where i got the idea from because he made me do the exact same thing. <laughs> i learned that my first class media class in college was how to wrap wires and i got a grade on it yeah and now 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 you got kids at the golf course learning how to string weed whackers properly for this for the <laughs> same reason so it's just you yeah. know good lessons like that got to get keep getting passed on and hopefully you know hopefully sometime down the road when they're doing something they'll be like yeah, man, this one boss I had, man, he just made me do this over and over and over again until I got it right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It'll happen. That's the way it <laughs> is. Well, Dr. Well, Jersey, listen, thank you so much. Definitely appreciate you, for sure. Um, you know, I'll definitely plug your podcast out there um, once I get back up and running. And we got to definitely do it again, for sure. All right. Sounds good, my friend. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Peace out.